Behind the Shower Curtain, a story written by C.J. Canatelli. Links to her website and social media will be available in the description down below. Even as a young girl, as far back as my memory goes, I have always checked behind the shower curtain any time I entered a bathroom. I don't understand it. I've never been afraid of the dark, monsters under my bed, or even horror movies for that matter. I was never a frightened little girl. My whole family and all my friends actually called me things like brave and fearless my entire life. I suppose I still have that type of reputation. But alas, I always check behind the shower curtain when entering a bathroom. I've done it since I could walk. It's one of my first memories. Every time I enter a bathroom, anxiety floods through my body and I freeze up for a moment. In a wild burst of adrenaline that never seems to fail me, I harshly fling aside the shower curtain and find an empty bathtub. I would always sigh with relief, chuckle quietly and go about whatever business I had in the bathroom. It wasn't even only when I was going to shower or use the toilet. It was every single time I entered the bathroom without fail. If I had to get something from the medicine cabinet, I had to check behind the shower curtain. If I had to blow my nose, I had to check behind the shower curtain. It's something that is so deeply ingrained in me that I don't think I'll ever be able to enter a bathroom and not look behind the shower curtain, especially considering what I saw there when I was nine years old. My father took off when my mom got pregnant with me. I've never met him, and I don't have any plans on meeting him in the future. I'm in my mid-twenties now, and these memories would have faded at least somewhat if I could ever allow myself to break free of my ritualistic shower surveillance. I still do it, and now I know I always will. I still feel a wave of terror rush over me when I enter a bathroom and remember I have to check. I've tried not checking, but I always cave before a moment even passes. I always talk myself out of not checking. What if there's a person? What if there's a monster? What if a raccoon is in there? I think of every possible scenario mostly ridiculous and impossible, but others somewhat probable while still being significantly unlucky. I imagine all kinds of things waiting for me behind the dreaded curtain. There's only ever been one time in my entire life that I flung that curtain aside to see something absolutely horrifying. I always wondered what I would do if something was actually in there. I suppose when it happened, I froze up for a second or two. Not that it made much of a difference in the end. But if it had been a serial killer or a monster, these precious seconds could have cost me my life. I remember that day so vividly, and my therapist says I'll always remember it like it just happened yesterday. I walked up the stairs, arriving home from my long day of school. I began to go into the bathroom, but I stopped. I always put off using the bathroom, because it was this entire ritual of checking behind the shower curtain. I put it off, stifling the urge to pee. I went back downstairs and grabbed a candy bar from the snack drawer. Eating it carefully, I turned on the television and remember Tom and Jerry being on for just a second. By the time I finished my three bites of chocolate, the show was on the credits, and the three o'clock Bugs Bunny show was almost on. I decided that if I didn't want to miss it, I had to run upstairs to the bathroom. I darted up the stairs, realizing I only had a short commercial break to do my business. Arriving in the bathroom, I lifted my hand 
to the light switch, but dropped my hand to my side. The bathroom's window was letting in a bright afternoon light, and I didn't really need to turn on the light. It was so bright in the bathroom that it just wasn't necessary. Natural lighting always had the way of making me feel braver. I hesitated before reaching for the shower curtain. Could today possibly be the day? I could just not look behind the shower curtain. I stared at it for a moment and giggled to myself nervously. Not today, I thought silently. I'm going to be ten in a few weeks. I've got to learn how to be brave, even when no one is looking. For the first and only time in my life, I pulled down my pants and sat on the toilet. I couldn't get myself to pee because I kept thinking about what could possibly be behind the shower curtain. I knew if I could just get this over with, that would be a conquered fear and it would give me a sense of accomplishment. Finally, I let the stream of urine go and my thoughts drifted to my D-plus in history on my report card. I dreaded showing my mother. Mother. As I stood up and pulled my pants up around my waist, I began to think about my mom. Where was she? She was normally waiting downstairs for me when I got home. I began to think maybe she had plans to go out today and I just didn't remember her telling me. It was strange, but it wouldn't be the first time something like that happened. Then again, I didn't worry about being home alone. It was the late 1980s, and people in my neighborhood left their kids home alone all the time. Hell, we didn't even lock our doors. It just wasn't something we thought about at the time. I washed my hands, and as I turned off the water, I heard a sound coming from the bathtub. I whirled around and nearly jumped out of my skin. I realized I heard the quiet tap of water dripping into a pool of water. Maybe mother had left the bathtub dripping? Then it hit me. It didn't sound like a drop or two of water hitting the bottom of an empty bathtub. It sounded familiar, like the tap dripping when I was sitting in a full bath. The color drained from my face. And after a moment of deliberation, I remembered something. Mom was supposed to clean this morning. Maybe she left the bathtub soaking in bleach like she sometimes did. The bleach wasn't burning my nose though, so that was rolled out. Maybe she left the bucket she used for mopping the floors filled underneath the dripping tap. I couldn't be sure. And there was really only one way to find out. Putting on my bravest face, I reached a quivering hand up to grab the floral shower curtain. In one quick movement, I flung the curtain open, stumbling backward against the sink like I sometimes did. It was like my brain couldn't process what I was seeing, and everything just kind of froze up on me for a minute or two. The bathtub was filled with a deep red liquid. I knew it was blood, but I was trying to rationalize some other explanation. Then I looked at the end of the tub, and I saw what appeared to be hair. I realized it was a head, bobbing up and down slowly in the pool of blood. Then I looked a bit closer and let out a loud Shriek. It wasn't just a head. It was my mother's head. It was my mother's head attached to her pale, lifeless corpse. And so I screamed. I screamed and screamed until my throat became raspy and dry as the Sahara. When I finally got my legs to move, I began running down the hallway and down the stairs. I fell about halfway down, tripping over my own shoes. I landed at the bottom on my back and felt the wind get knocked right out of me. My front door swung open 
and Mrs. Belton from next door ran to my side. Beatrice, Beatrice, what's all the screaming? She ran to my side and helped me up. Are you all right? Did you get hurt? Where's your mother? I couldn't answer her. I raised a trembling finger and pointed up the stairs to the bathroom door. Then I screamed and screamed some more, tears rushing down both sides of my face. Mrs. Belton ran up the stairs and I heard her gasp when she reached the bathroom door. She saw what I had seen and came running down the stairs, grabbing me by the arm and yanking me out of the house. Before I knew it, fire trucks, three police cars, and two ambulances were blocking off my street. All the neighborhood kids watched my mother's body get wheeled out on a gurney, but it was covered in a black bag. The paramedics at one of the ambulances were checking me out. I had a big bruise on my back from falling and I had hit the back of my head, which was bleeding a little bit. When a crisis worker showed up, she talked to me for a little while, but I couldn't answer her. I couldn't move or speak at all. She said something about inpatient care, and the ambulance took me to a building with a white hospital room. They hooked all these needles into my arm and had me lay down. They said they put something in the needle to make me sleep for a while. And the last thing I remember seeing was Mr. and Mrs. Belton with their twin boys rushing into the room. Everything went black after that. After a few hours, I woke and was sent home with the Belton family. They lived right next door to where I had lived. And after a few weeks, they had packed up everything to move me into their new house across town. Mrs. Belton promised that they were planning to move anyway, but I heard Mr. and Mrs. Belton talking in the kitchen in hushed whispers about a mortgage they couldn't afford, all to get me away from the neighborhood. They took me in and raised me like their own. We didn't talk about my mother's suicide until after I graduated from college. To this day, no one knows why she did it. She didn't leave a note. She didn't act differently. There were simply no clues as to what could have driven my mother to slit her wrists in the tub that afternoon. And I suppose I don't want to know why she did it. Sure, there's this nagging in the back of my mind every now and again that leaves me wondering if it was my fault. The Beltons always assure me that my mother was having a midlife crisis and that it had nothing to do with me. I still find that all very hard to believe, but I get by just fine. I have a great life. I just have to go to therapy once a week and I always have to check behind the shower curtain. I'll probably be doing that for the rest of my natural life.